Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God, back with you with the next video in my series reading, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Without further ado, returning to The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, as read by Lord Naren White. A whole hour drifted by. The master sat nodding in his throne. The air was drowsy with the hum of study. By and by, Mr. Dobbins straightened himself up, yawned, then unlocked his desk, and reached for his book, but seemed undecided whether to take it out or leave it. Most of the pupils glanced up languidly, but there were two among them that watched his movements with intent eyes. Mr. Dobbins fingered his book absently for a while, then took it out and settled himself in his chair to read. Tom shot a glance at Becky. He had seen a hunted and helpless rabbit look as she did, with a gun leveled at its head. Instantly, he forgot his quarrel with her. Quick, something must be done. Done in a flash, too. But the very imminence of the emergency paralyzed his invention. Good. He had an inspiration. He would run and snatch the book spring through the door and fly. But his resolution shook for one little instant, and the chance was lost. The master opened the volume. If Tom open only had the wasted opportunity back again, too late. There was no help for Becky now, he said. The next moment the master faced the school. Every eye sank under his gaze. There was that in which smote even the innocent with fear. There was silence while one might count ten. The master was gathering his wrath. Then he spoke. Who tore this book? There was not a sound. One could have heard a pin drop. The stillness continued. The master searched face after face for signs of guilt. Benjamin Rogers... Did you tear this book? A, a denial. Another pause. Joseph Harper, did you? Another denial. Tom's uneasiness grew more and more intense under the slow torture of these proceedings. The master scanned the ranks of boys, considered a while, then turned to the girls. Amy Lawrence, a shake of the head. Gracie Miller, the same sign. Susan Harper, did you do this? Another negative. The next girl was Becky Thatcher. Tom was trembling from head to foot with excitement and a sense of hopeless, hopelessness of the situation. Rebecca Thatcher? Tom glanced at her face. It was white with terror. Did you tear? No. Look me in the face. Her hands rose in appeal. Did you tear this book? A thought shot like lightning through Tom's brain. He sprang to his feet and shouted, I done it! The school stared in perplexity at this incredible folly. Tom stood a moment to gather his dismembered faculties, and when he stepped forward to go to his punishment, the surprise, the gratitude, the adoration that shone upon him out of poor Becky's eyes seemed to pay enough for a hundred floggings. Inspired by the splendor of his own act, he took without an outcry the most merciless flaying that even Mr. Dobbins had ever administered, and also received with indifference the added cruelty of a command to remain two hours after school should be dismiss dismissed for he knew who would wait for him outside till his captivity was done, and not count the tedious time as loss either. Tom went to bed that night, planning vengeance against Alfred Temple, for with shame and repentance Becky had told him all, not forgetting her own treachery. But even the longing for vengeance had to give way, soon, to pleasanter musings. He fell asleep at last with Becky's latest words lingering dreamily in his ear. 
Tom, how could you be so noble? Chapter 21 Vacation was approaching. The schoolmaster, always severe, grew severer and more exacting than ever. For he wanted the school to make a good showing on examination day. His rod and his ferule were seldom idle now, at least among the smaller pupils. Only the biggest boys and young ladies of eighteen and twenty escaped lashing. Mr. Dobbins's lashing, lashings were very vigorous ones too, for although he carried under his wig a perfectly bald and shiny head, he had only reached middle age and there was no sign of feebleness in his muscle. As the great day approached, all the tyranny that was in them came to the surface. He seemed to take a vindictive pleasure in punishing the least shortcomings. The consequence was that the smaller boys spent their days in terror and suffering their nights in plotting revenge. They threw away no opportunity to do the master mischief but he kept ahead all the time. The retribution that followed every vengeful success was so sweeping and majestic that the boys always retired from the field badly worsted. At last, they conspired together and hit upon a plan that promised a dazzling victory. They swore in the sign painter's boy, told him the scheme, and asked his help. He had his own reasons for being delighted, for the master boarded in his father's family and had given the boy ample cause to hate him. The master's wife would go on a visit to the country in a few days, and there would be nothing to interfere with the plan. The master always prepared himself for great occasions by getting pretty well fuddled. And the sign painter's boy said, that when the domine had reached the proper condition on examination evening, he would manage the thing while he napped in his chair. Then he would have him awakened at the right time and hurried away to school. In the fullness of time, the interesting occasion arrived. At eight in the evening, the schoolhouse was brightly, brilliantly lighted and adorned with wreaths and festoons of foliage and flowers. The master sat throned in his great chair upon a raised platform, with his black board behind him. He was looking tolerably mellow. Three rows of benches on each side, and six rows in front of him, were occupied by the dignitaries of the town and by the parents of the pupils. To his left, back of the rows of citizens, was a spacious temporary platform upon which were seated the scholars who were to take part in the exercises of the evening. Rows of small boys, washed and dressed to an intolerable state of discomfort. Rows of gawky big boys, snowbanks of girls and young ladies clad in lawn and muslin and conspicuously conscious of their bare arms, their grandmother's ancient trinkets, their bits of pink and blue ribbon, and the flowers in their hair. All the rest of the house was filled with non-participating scholars. The exercises began. A very little boy stood up and sheepishly recited, You'd scarce expect one of my age to be able to speak in public on the stage, etc., accompanying himself with the painfully exact and spasmodic gestures which a machine might have used, supposing the machine to be a trifle out of order. But he got through safely, though cruelly scared, and got a fine round of applause when he made his manufactured bow and retired. A little shame-faced girl lisped, Mary had a little lamp etc., performed a compassion-inspiring curtsy, got her meed of applause, and sat down flush and happy.
Tom Sawyer stepped forward with conceited confidence and soared into the unquenchable and indestructible. Give me liberty or give me death. Speech with fine fury and frantic gesticulation and broke down in the middle of it. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.